Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Taco Tuesday edition on Cinco de Mayo. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and today is May 5th, 2020, episode 594. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. Before we get too far into the show, please like, subscribe, comment, share, anything I'm missing. Oh, we have a podcast in the show notes if you want to listen to us on podcast. Go to the comments. we got lots of great comments from uh, all the priests out there who watch this program on whether or not they would conduct a Zoom wedding. Uh <laughs> From what I can read, most of you aren't going to conduct a Zoom wedding. Uh, and some of you don't collect fees. I need to talk to you guys later. <clears throat> Got one more daughter coming through the, the chain. So, uh, George, it's been another COVID week, and I thought we could uh, catch up on what's been happening around the Anglican Communion, uh, especially there's still a revolt going along uh, with the clergy in the Church of England. Now we're hearing more of the uh, African clergy speaking up about a little bit more fairness between restaurants and churches. Uh, give us the latest on England. Well, in England, um, the uh, lockdown continues, but we're seeing sort of a, uh, a grassroots rebellion. Uh, there was a letter in the Times yesterday uh, basically saying that the bishops of the Church of England have overstepped their authority and, abd and abdicated their leadership positions by not allowing uh, vicars and rectors into their churches to live stream or broadcast services. Um, this is accompanied by, over the weekend, by an article in The Tablet, a Roman Catholic uh, news magazine, by Peter Selby. He's the retired Bishop of Worcester. Now, Selby was always a great liberal on, on the progressive side of uh, religious and social issues. But Selby also had the reputation of being an excellent pastoral bishop. This is somebody who, if you may not agree with his theology, he still was in your corner. Mm -hmm. So he was, uh, he was a good bishop, even if, you know, and, and we see these. We see not all bishops who think right are good bishops. I mean, they have no human interpersonal <laughs> skills. Well, Selby wrote an article that I think is, how should I say, it was an earthquake. I, I'd call it an earthquake. Because what Selby did was say that the decision by the House of Bishops to close churches to their clergy was not explained, not reasonable, and basically undercuts the whole foundations of who the Church of England is. And what you've done Selby has said, is alienate so many sectors of society. You've made the church irrelevant, and it's been fighting not to be irrelevant for years, and you've given yourself a self-inflicted wound. And uh, it just I, I, was a very strong letter pointing out the, the poor leadership of the House of Bishops and their silence on these issues. I did an interview probably five years ago with Gerald Bray, and he brought me up to date on what life is like in the Church of England in England. He goes, you Americans, you just love the Church of England. You want to be uh, one with the Church of England. You want to be accepted by the Church of England. But in Britain, in England, the Church of England is like the public library. It's just another government entity. Um, and if it's open and serves you, you're happy. If you go to the doors, it's closed. I'll come back another day. And I never really sunk in until, you know, the last couple of years watching, as far as I'm concerned, at the archbishop level, the dereliction of duty. They've just walked away from having the churches open in any shape or form. And I think society as a whole is like, yeah, we didn't think you'd be open anyway. One of the points Selby makes is that by forcing clergy, uh, he says a lot of clergy are doing a lot of great things on the grassroots, and and we've said that too. Mm -hmm. And across the board, we're seeing some very creative and faithful uh, clergy on, all across the theological spectrum, tempting to continue their ministries via social media and the internet. He, uh, but P Selby pointed out the Catholic Church is allowing their clergy to live stream from churches. So first off, this is a bit of a, 
you know, the Church of England is really big about being ecumenical and moving in conjunction with other churches on these sorts of issues. They just decided without talking to the Catholics. So the Catholics uh, won this round, if you will, on the PR points. But Selby's point is the medium in this case is the message. By forcing people from those symbols of stability, the church building, of faithfulness, of stability, of being there for the long haul that you can always count on the Church of England, and forcing the forcing people to broadcast from their kitchen tables, you're basically saying that you can't count on the Church of England. And it's a devastating critique, and because I think it's well, it's well said. It is, because this is a, a whole new surreal time. And from what I can tell, we're seeing kind of the COVID awakening. Uh, online, more and more on Sunday mornings, people are turning on live streams, the church services that they haven't attended for years, uh, or other people's uh, church services, and they're worshiping. And they're joining the morning prayers and the afternoon prayers and the evening prayers. And I'm sure they're not competing with the viewership of porn yet. But once again, uh, the gospel is making strides online. And what you, we see the Church of England closed. Selby uh, makes a point of citing a, a commentator who says this is the BC uh, AC oh, BC, before yeah. Corona <laughs> and after Corona moment. Uh -huh. We've been getting uh, correspondence from clergy in the Church of England, um, not only the people who are our regular friends, but new people have been writing to us. And and one of the things they've been saying is that this is an emperor has no clothes moment. Yeah. Now, what does that mean? It means that the bishops have been exposed basically for being non-essential workers. Uh, the clergy, the actual people being there at one with the people in need at the if at the at the rock face mm -hmm. uh, if you will the um for the miners and whatnot that's right the uh they're there with the bishops and their staffs and their diversity officers and their ecumenical office i mean the whole apparatus of the church of england's institutional entity has now been reduced to sitting at the kitchen table so why do you need all this stuff and the point that's been made is that the usual people like us who grumble and bone and point out failings, well, we're always going to complain. But we're seeing people who have essentially, from a church perspective, been non-political, rise up and say, look, this really is an atrocious decision that you've taken. And the moral authority of the Archbishop of Canterbury may or may not be bare sole responsibility because this is a collective decision we're told even though we're not really told how they decided <laughs> the moral authority, moral authority is something that in part comes from your office but it also comes from your actions and the moral authority that the Archbishop of Canterbury had has been severely damaged because his actions as the figurehead leader of the Church of England have shown that he cannot be counted on in a, in a difficult moment. That the clergy, he's basically saying clergy are non-essential. Clergy don't really have a purpose. They're busy bee social workers who can be dispensed with when uh, going gets tough. When for most clergy, uh, our, we step into our place when the going gets tough. We're there and the cry. In other words, you don't need them in the crisis, the institution is saying, whereas the clergy's worked experiences, we're only there in the crisis for most people. Well, this is the Church of England has been revealed as a government entity, non-essential social worker. And I think the Archbishop of York and the Archbishop of Canterbury completely agree. We don't want to put anybody in danger. We're going to close our doors and uh, just hope for the best. We're going to hope for the best. Some of the published, they've given very few reasons why they've done this. Because, well, let's give a little bit of background. The government uh, banned group gatherings uh, under a police of powers in an emergency, banned gatherings of so many people. So in essence, effectively, worship could not take place. Mm -hmm. But the government did not say clergy were in were non-essential. They were allowed to continue their ministries without meeting in groups. 
And then the Church of England went beyond that. They went beyond that and said, you cannot step foot into your churches because we want you to be a good example of a good citizen. And this is also coupled with we have clergy volunteering to serve as volunteer unpaid chaplains in hospitals when, with COVID patients. No, I'm sorry. Uh, we don't want you to do that. It's better not to do that. And you can talk to people on the telephone. Well, friends, this is, speaks to an absolute ignorance of the actual reality of hospital ministry and chaplaincy. Uh, this, it is the physical presence, and sometimes is ninety percent of your job. Um, so oh, the, the the Church of England's just the managerial leadership decisions have been atrocious. Well, around the world, Christians want to be good citizens. And when the yeah. government calls for stay at home, social distance, be responsible, Christian, we as Christians, yeah, we understand that. that yeah, we got you, got you covered. Close your churches. Ah, ah, yo, that's, that's hard. Um, because we can be responsible in church. We love our neighbors. We love the people who worship with us. We will find a way. Uh, the church for 2,000 years has fought and found a way. And all of a sudden, to be good citizens now, we have to close our churches and uh, lock the congregants out. No, that's that's not going to work. Now, in Africa, we see the clergy saying, uh, we want our churches open. It's a different dynamic there. Uh, there in Africa, it's... They are under the same lockdown that you see in Europe and the United States. And in some parts of Africa, it's much stricter. Uh, for instance, in Rwanda, uh, there's no public transport now. And people don't own cars anyway. Yeah. So people really are stuck at home. Uh, and in a number of African countries, of Kenya, for instance, has uh, re-upped its uh, lockdown. And the governor and the uh, Archbishop of Kenya, Jackson Ole Sapit, has said, uh, Kenyans, I urge you to comply with the government mandates. But he also turns to the government and says, look, you're not allowing restaurants uh, to function uh, under the social distancing rules. Can we not have churches function under the social distancing rules? So the African churches are approaching the government as co-equal partners in civil society, saying, okay, it's your call at the end of the day as the civil magistrate, but we are able to function under the constraints that you give us for social health benefits. At Nigeria, the president uh, lifted the curfew in Lagos and Abuja and the major cities, and the archbishop in, in Nigeria put out a statement saying, okay, the curfew's been lifted, but let's be careful, folks. We need to um, not rush to gather, together and gather in groups of hundreds, uh, but, you know, stop the spread be, of this disease. So responsible. here, here yeah. we have the Church of England presents itself as basically the clergy cannot function as sentient adults. They're children that must be just sent to their rooms and there's no, no, nothing that they are able to do out of their own competence. Well, the clergy in Africa are able to say to the governments, okay, we'll comply, but here, you know, let's find the way to make our spiritual work carry on in this difficult time while complying with government orders. Well, uh, let's back up a little. Even if all the churches around the world were open, the attendance would be extremely low. Um, you have to think of it in, you live down by the villages uh, and you went to a restaurant yesterday. How did that go? Well, Susan and I, yesterday the governor reopened restaurants. Restaurants may open with outdoor seating and seating 25% inside. And we decided, to, the, the Villages is the closest place with nice restaurants, Just nicer very, restaurants. Very nice restaurants. Uh, in, in Lakanto, we have a Wawa. Oh, hold on. And Let, we have a Wendy's. Let's back up. Most of our audience around the road globe don't understand what the villages are it's where uh, middle class to upper class retirees have a village called the villages 
uh, many houses, uh, condos where they go and live, and it's become a population. Is it like almost ninety thousand down there? What's it like? It's the yeah. fastest growing county zip code in the United States uh, it's for the last ten years or so. Okay, it's all middle class, upper middle class, retired, depending on how much you're going to spend. <laughs> retirees from the northeast and the midwest it's disneyland for adults yes it is. if you can remember the cult 1960s movie the prisoner that's uh, right tv show the prisoner oh, that is it <laughs> it's sort of <laughs> like that uh well susan and i went over to have lunch at one of the nicer restaurants there because we don't have many options here in, in hooterville well when we got there it seats 200 and we went in and usually there's a line about 15 20 minutes at lunchtime and there's no line we were seated immediately and we looked around there was one other couple in the restaurant 200 empty tables and about a dozen waiters and waitresses servers excuse me servers standing around and there were two or three couples outside on the porch but um this uh, this is a community where the people have the disposable income to eat out, and they one of their way restaurants are big business down in the part of the world because older people like to socialize and eat out. Comple it was a ghost town, and as we drove through sort of the restaurant area, the restaurant strip of the villages, um, all the restaurants were empty. Yeah. I mean, it was just like it. It was just what we saw at our little restaurant, not medium-sized restaurant. We saw at everything from uh, Texas Roadhouse. There were no cars. There were two cars there, mm -hmm. to the the Chili's, to the you know all the giant chains. The empty. Yeah. Nobody's out. Well, I think you know Florida's going to really suffer under this. Now, I look at this as the a point of an investor. I'm an amateur investor. I, I own stocks. I sell stocks. I uh, research companies, and this virus has brought about something that is just surreal. What parent is going to drive their child down to Disneyland or Disney World uh, or any tourist attraction? To have little Bobby have his picture taken with Cinderella, who's wearing a mask, and is Cinderella going to bend over and give little Bobby a, a big hug? And what grandparent? Now, Disneyland and Disney World were largely supported by grandparents taking grandchildren there too. Nobody over fifty-five is going to go to Disney anymore. Nobody over fifty-five is going to hop on a plane and cross the ocean um, to go to tourist places. Tourism is shut down. Uh, in most crowded areas until there's a vaccine. Uh, just because the people who can't afford to go won't go. It's all different now. I uh, took a I took a group of about a dozen children to a preseason baseball game, Phillies versus the Red Sox, uh, in uh, at beginning of March, weekend before the shutdown hit. And the stadium in Clearwater, 15,000 capacity crowd, um, Florida, mostly older grandparents with their children or mm -hmm. priests with the youth group because <laughs> uh, it's the only tickets you can afford. Sure. Uh, but that indoor sports, maybe outdoor sports won't be as hard hit, but indoor sports is dead. Yeah. And uh, you, you're not going to get people in basketball stadiums or, or hockey rinks or even baseball stadiums because of the you know cheek and jowl and the screaming and the yelling and and the exchange of uh, virus germs. <laughs> no, I know. The screaming, the blowing into those little horns with the little spittle coming out. Those days are gone. Uh, really gone. I, you, the, imagine the Super Bowl being unattended. I, you know, until, the, look, until there's a vaccine, this is the surreal normal. I don't want to say new normal. It's just going to, you're just going to have to adapt to it. And this is the, where the church can really adapt. This is where we should adapt well. I think we've covered all the COVID news we want to cover, George. Well, actually, I, there is <laughs> yeah, a so COVID-related follow-up I'd like to touch sure, on. Sure, go ahead. We did a story last week about the Zoom marriage in Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. one of the Gulf states where an expatriate couple were married in the Anglican church there. And the couple were in their home, 
according to the Times of London and then the National, which is one of the English language newspapers in the Gulf. And the priest was in the church and the family from around the world watched via Zoom. And they were married uh, in the church, in a lawful church wedding. And we talked about, would you all do that? Well, I've had comments from clergy who've served in the Gulf as well as the Archdeacon of Cyprus in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. Clergy who've served in the Gulf said, George, you need to understand that in many of these, some of these, there were little hints here that this was a rush job. It's against the law in a number of these Gulf states for unmarried couples to live together. <laughs> so if you're going to live with somebody, you've got to get married. Uh, otherwise, you're expelled or it's a criminal offense. And so there probably was some pressure. In other words, it wasn't the United States or Europe where, well, just wait till it's all over. You got, they had to get married right away. So what, so the guy would say, cut them some slack. They were just trying to basically not lose their residency permits. And second, the Archdeacon of Cyprus uh, of the Gulf, responsible for that part of the world said, please do not make a big issue of that. No, we do not allow this to happen, but we allow pastoral latitude and uh, don't please don't talk about this. Yeah. So I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> well, you mentioned comments. I'm going to put comments here on the screen. Um, if you guys want to sometime this week or right if you watch the show, go and check out the comments and add your own. I would like to know, uh, those of you who are 55, and I would imagine that's the majority of our audience, who's going to hop on a, a plane this summer and fly to a tourist location? Um, let, you know, who's going to uh, spend any tourist dollars at all before there's a, uh, uh, a vaccine? I, I would like to know your thoughts on this. All right, great. That's it. Awesome Tuesday show. Please run to Taco Bell. Get your Taco Tuesdays on Cinco de Mayo. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 594 of Anglican Unscripted.